Well, this morning, I am in the eighth week of my sermon series entitled Strength and Weakness. I'm looking at the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians. And if you're unfamiliar with this book, it was written by the Apostle Paul as a letter to a church in Corinth that he had started around the year 50 AD. He stayed there for a few years, built it up, passed it off to some leaders in the community, moved on to plant other churches, and then wrote some letters along the way as he heard of issues going on in the church. And so this is the second letter that we have by him, 2 Corinthians, it's called. Uh, Corinth was part of the Roman Empire. It's part of Greece today. Uh, so it was, it was more of a Gentile, non-Jewish culture and uh, community there. And in this section we're going to be reading today, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It's a pretty long section, but it kind of holds together, so I didn't want to break it up. He's essentially writing to them to remind them uh, of a collection that he's taking for the church in Judea, the church, a Jewish church uh, around Jerusalem, that area, that had undergone a famine. And so basically he was doing famine relief and trying to collect some money from some of the Gentile churches to help the church in Judea. And so this portion of 2 Corinthians is a plea for generosity. And as often is the case with Paul, he doesn't just write two sentences saying, hey, don't forget, I'm coming to, you know, collect some money. He lays out a whole theology on why we should be generous and why the gospel in particular should free us up to be generous people. And so... We're going to read a longer portion of scripture today, um, but it has a lot, a lot to say. There's a whole vision I hope you catch here of what God wants to do among his people to make us people who are generous. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and now brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Side note there, Macedonian churches included the churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. So he says, out of the most severe trial... Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality, as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. I thank God who put it into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering, which we administer in in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous, and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, They are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give, and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. 
Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in, and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. All right, let me pray before we continue. Lord, help us to understand this passage, what it means. Help us to apply this to our lives, Lord that we might be transformed more and more into the men and women that you have created us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, summarizing that long passage, essentially Paul is sending Titus and a couple other men to the Corinthians to help them prepare for this gift that they're going to be giving, hopefully, he hopes, if they haven't changed their mind, to the church in Judea that has undergone a serious famine. Okay? So, notice as we look at this, he lays out this vision for what God's people, what God's community, and even what the world might look like if we would become generous people, if we truly understand the gospel, if we'd be transformed by the gospel. So I want to look at this passage, first of all, look at three things he doesn't say. Because remember, he's trying to persuade the Corinthians to be generous. He's trying to encourage them to give and to share with those who don't have as much as they do. There's three things that he doesn't say, and then there's four reasons he gives to be generous. So three things, though, he he does not say. The first is this. Notice he never mentions money. This long passage, he never mentions the Greek word for money. He uses these words instead. Grace, privilege, partnership, sharing, service, ministry, earnestness, love, willingness, generosity, abundance, liberal gift, undertaking, blessing, generous gift, work. Evidently, to Paul, this is not about money. This is about something on a heart level. The opportunity they have to give to the church in Judea is not about money. Take some of your money and give it to them. It's about something deeper going on on a heart level. That's why he's not talking about money. He's talking about something deeper. Secondly, he never orders them to give. He never comes out and says, listen, as the one who started this church, you need to collect this amount of money and give it. Instead, he says this, I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. And then he says, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So clearly, he took two chapters to talk about this. Clearly, he thinks they should give. Clearly, he thinks this is important, that whether or not they give reflects something upon their heart and their understanding of the gospel. But he says, I'm not commanding you to give. I'm not telling you you have to give. I don't want this to be under compulsion or reluctantly. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves someone who wants to give, who joyfully gives out of their heart. I'm not commanding you. I'm not telling you you have to give. And thirdly, he does not give them an amount or a percentage to give. He doesn't say, listen, set aside 10%, set aside 5%, set aside $1,000, whatever. It doesn't give money. It doesn't give, I mean, it doesn't give amounts. It doesn't give percentages and say, this is what you need to do. He speaks to their heart and he encourages them and tells them, this is really important and I want you to give, but I'm not commanding you. I'm not telling you you have to and I'm not giving you a percentage. I'm not giving you an amount. This is important because You're never going to find on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection anywhere where the Bible talks about tithing, talks about a specific amount or specific percentage. That's an Old Testament principle, tithing, where they set aside the first 10% of your income to give to God for the 
care of the tabernacle or the temple, for the care of the priests who work there, for the care of the poor. This side of the cross and resurrection, it is all about the heart, generosity. It is about you giving all that you have to God. Everything that you are belongs to him. And out of that flows giving. But each one should decide in his heart, in his her heart, what is right to give, what is generous to give, not under compulsion. This is a message that a lot of churches and religious leaders probably need to hear, right? Many of you have probably been in churches where uh, you've been either guilted or shamed or compelled or forced or Bible's been twisted in such a way to compel you to give. But the reality is it's about your heart. It's about generosity. And generosity does not have a dollar amount. Generosity does not have a percentage attached to it. Some people can give... 50% of their income. Some people might only be able to give 5% of their income or 2% of their income, depending on where they are in their lives. But the point is, are you generous? And what does your giving reflect upon your heart and your understanding of the gospel? So these are the three things he never mentions. It's important to notice that beforehand to understand how does he encourage people to be generous? He doesn't mention money. He doesn't order them to give. And he never gives them a percentage or an amount. This is what he does instead. First of all, he appeals to the generosity and the grace of God. He says that is what transforms us. Again, his concern is, yes, I want them to give, but if they're not giving, what does that say about their heart? What does that say about their understanding of the gospel, their understanding of who God is? So he, first of all, wants to teach them about the generosity and grace of God. He says in 2 Corinthians 8 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. The word grace is best understood. The best definition I've heard is this. Grace is an undeserved gift given by an unobligated giver. In other words, God owes us nothing, and we deserve nothing, but God still gives generously to us. That's grace God owes you nothing, and you deserve nothing, but God generously gives. And so he appeals to the grace of God. Again, going back to that verse, he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, though he lived in heaven, though he had everything that he could ever want and lived in perfect harmony with the Father and the Holy Spirit, he became poor. He gave that up. He took on flesh. He became a human. He lived among us, not as some rich, wealthy individual, but among the poor, so that we might be blessed, so that we might become rich. And when I say rich, I do not mean financially wealthy. We'll get into that in a minute. As Paul wrote elsewhere, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to death on a cross. That's what he's talking about here. You know Jesus. Though he was rich, he became poor. Though he was greater than everyone, he became a servant to all. That we might be rich, spiritually wealthy, eternally wealthy, Consider what Romans 8, 16 to 17, Paul writes, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Remember that we're adopted as God's children now. And it says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. It says, you are an heir. You know what happens when you have a wealthy grandparent who dies and then leaves you money? Because that is nothing compared to this. That God, you are an heir of everything that is God's, everything that is his. And I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. I know of what it's going to be like when we are with him forever. And all the riches and glory of God are shared with us forever. We are wealthy beyond all imagination. It's not about material wealth. It's about knowing God and having him and whatever that is that he's going to share with us for all eternity. 
I've never quoted this man before, but Gregory of Nazianus put it this way, Christ was made poor that we through his poverty might be rich. He took the form of a servant that we might regain liberty. He descended that we might be exalted. He was tempted that we might overcome. He was despised that he might fill us with glory. And he died that we might be saved. So how does Paul try to encourage generosity? Not by giving them a dollar amount, not by compelling them, not by talking about money, by appealing to their heart, first of all, and pointing them to the grace and generosity of God. Because this is the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his son for you, that you are an heir, that everything he has is yours. And if you understand that, if you've been transformed by that, that it will cause you to be generous, to give as he has given to you, to be generous as he's been generous with you. Romans 8.32 tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So what I prayed earlier, I said, listen, when you're having a hard time trusting in God, you look to the cross and you realize that he gave you his best. He gave you his son. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give you everything that you need? Not everything you want, but he will give you everything that you need. And so we go out into the world with this mindset that I can be generous, that I can share, that I can give as he's given to me, knowing that I have got a father in heaven who loves me. I'm an heir of everything that's his, and I can give knowing that he cares for me. He gave his son, and he will give me everything that I need. Again, Paul wants them to be generous, but he's concerned about their heart, not about a dollar amount. He says, you give whatever is on your heart to give. But his concern is, if you don't give, what does that reveal about your heart? And what does that reveal about your understanding of the gospel? And what does that reveal about your understanding of who God is and his love and care for you? Does that make sense? I'm concerned about your heart. I'm not concerned about dollar amounts of what you give to me or to anyone else. That's not that's between you and God. I am concerned about your heart. And if you have a hard time sharing, if you have a hard time giving, if you have a hard time being generous, what does that reveal about your heart? What does it reveal about your understanding of the gospel, of God's grace, of the generosity that he has poured out on you? What does it reveal about your trust that God is a loving father who cares for you, who has given you his son and will give you everything that you need? so that you can trust him. Paul begins this section by pointing to the Macedonian church. He's like, they get it. You know, those Macedonians, they get it. He says, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. There may be some truth to this, that sometimes it's the people who have gone through poverty, some pe the people who have gone through trials who are more generous because they know what it's like to be in that place and they want to give then when they get out of that place as opposed to maybe those who are richer or have more money and maybe more stingy and more afraid and more, you know, might blame those who don't have. But he says, look at the Macedonians, look at them, they get it. I didn't even have to ask them and they just wanted to give. They wanted to be generous to this church who had undergone this famine. They wanted to give. And so Paul goes on to say this in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. If you're not familiar with the language of sowing and reaping, it's farming metaphors. You sow seed, and then you reap a harvest. And he says that's how it works in the spiritual realm. You sow, and you reap a harvest. And again, this is the sort of language that televangelists have twisted to say, sow a seed into their ministry, and you're going to get all kinds of money back just so they can rip you off. I'm not saying that at all. You sow a seed, you reap a harvest. The harvest is not the seeds. It's not you get seeds back. The harvest you reap is spiritual. It's eternal. It's seeing the difference that God is using you to make in the lives of others. 
And he says that God will provide what you need so you can continue to be generous as you step out and give, that he will provide what you need so you can continue to be give because you know God is saying, all right, there's someone who gets it. There's someone who's generous, and I'm going to supply them with what they need so they can continue to give and be generous. Again, I'm not just talking about money here. Remember, they said this earlier in the passage. They did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. There are many ways to be generous. Money is not the only way, right? You can be generous with your time with others. You can be generous in listening to others. You can be generous with your counsel to others, with mentoring others, with coaching others. You can be generous in serving others and doing tangible acts of service for people. You can be generous with your words. There are so many ways to be generous. I'm not just talking about money here. But the heart of the one who knows that God has been generous and full of grace to them becomes a transformed heart that wants to be generous with others. And this is all related to the second reason to be generous, which is this. True wealth is not material. Do you believe this? Hopefully the older you are, the more you have recognized this. The younger you are, you are maybe you haven't gotten this message yet. But true wealth is not money. It's not material. There are many miserable millionaires who can attest to that? Amen. True wealth is not found in money. Listen to Revelation, a couple letters that, from Jesus to the churches. One says this, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. That's the church in Laodicea. And then the church in Smyrna, he says, to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Amen? Some of you out here are poor, materially speaking, but that does not mean you are poor. Because true wealth is not material. And some of you are rich, but it doesn't mean that you are wealthy because true wealth is not found in money and possessions. Makes me think of one of the greatest movies. It's a Wonderful Life, right? This is Harry saying was, to my brother George, the richest man in town. Great story of someone who gave himself sacrificially for others. He was the wealthiest man in town, not Mr. Potter. Or think of Paul quoting Jesus. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said, it is more blessed to give than receive. True wealth is not money. It's not riches. There's something more valuable than that. It's not having a million dollars in the bank. It's, true wealth is when you don't even need to worry about money because you know God and you trust him and you know he'll take care of all your needs. True wealth is when you can be generous and help others and see how God is using you to bless others. True wealth comes when you've gotten rid of the lie that happiness is found in a bigger bank account. That's why Jesus says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, Paul could have just written two lines to the Corinthians and said, listen, I'm coming to collect. I need to just set aside 5%. It's going to the church in Judea. But his concern is not money. His concern is their hearts, and my concern is also your heart. Are you generous? Are you inclined towards sharing and giving towards those who are in need? If not, what does that reveal about your heart? What does it say about your understanding of the gospel of God's grace? Or what does it say about your understanding of a God who loves you and trusts you? I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry loves you and cares for you that you can trust in. Third thing that Paul says to encourage generosity is this, that generous people create a more just and equitable world. He says this in 2 Corinthians 8, 13 to 15, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. And then there will be equality. As it is written, 
He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. You hear the word equality, and that's a buzzword these days. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about justice and equality, and I think those who are preaching those kind of gospels and messages would do well to learn from Paul here, because Paul knows that you cannot force people into equality and justice. You cannot compel people. You cannot guilt and shame people into equality. That equality and justice come when hearts have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by an understanding of the God of grace, so that people want to give to those who do not have, want to care for those who are oppressed, want to lift up those who are beaten down, because that's what Jesus did when he left heaven and took on the form of a servant to lift us up and exalt us. That's how you find equality and justice. Not by forcing and compelling and guilting and shaming people into it. In verse 15, Paul quotes from Exodus and the story of God providing the manna in the wilderness. This is what happened in Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 16. It says this, this is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did that as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. And Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So he is talking about equality and sharing with those who have needs. He's talking to a church that's rich in Corinth about this church in Judea that just went through a famine and is poor. And he's, saying, he's encouraging them to share. And he quotes from this passage where God provided manna from heaven as they were wandering in the wilderness, but they were only to collect what they needed for their home, not to hoard more at the expense of others. And he says if they took too much and tried to save it for the next day, it would rot. It would be filled with maggots and begin to smell. And maybe Paul is using this illustration to tell us that, listen, wealth, material wealth, when you try to hoard too much, it's going to start to rot. It's going to start to rot your soul. If you are not looking to share, if you do not have a heart inclined towards generosity, listen to 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 11. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. How many of us can say that? People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I think Paul is saying here, if we hoard up too much for ourselves, it's going to start to rot our soul. If our hearts are not inclined towards generosity, towards sharing, towards justice, towards equality. Listen to how Paul put it in Ephesians 4.28. He said, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say stop stealing, work with your own hands so that you can take care of yourself, so you can provide for your means. He says, no, stop stealing, work with your own hands, get a job, work so that you would have something to share with those in need. That's the end goal. The end goal is not so that you can have more for yourself, so that you can share with those who are in need, so that you can be generous with those who do not have. It was funny, as I was preparing this sermon, I was up here on Thursday or Friday of this week, and I was preparing the sermon and wrestling with this idea of generosity and equality and justice. And a woman, I noticed a woman coming to our front door of our church. And uh, I went over and opened the door. She introduced herself. She said she had been coming regularly to this church on Friday nights because we had a prayer meeting pre-COVID that was praying for uh, um, people who had been sold into slavery. And so she was praying against the human trafficking, and she would come here every Sunday, I mean, every Friday night. And she mentioned that um, she had noticed that we had the same couches and pillows that we, she had at her home, and she had bought a couch set, and they only sent her one pillow instead of two. And she said, I know this is a very odd request, 
is there any chance you have an extra pillow? Because I've asked them and they have no more pillows that they can share. And I only have one pillow and I'd really like a second pillow for my couch. And I looked at our couch out there. We had four pillows on this one couch. And I was like, yes, of course, you can have one of our pillows. <laughs> what do we need four pillows for this one couch for? And it was just hilarious to me, this example that God was giving me in the midst of preparing about equality and sharing and generosity that, yes, I have four pillows and you have one. I don't need four pillows on my couch. You can have a second pillow. It's a silly example, but God just gave it to me to, to remind me again, this is what I'm talking about here. You have more than you need. You don't need this much. There are others who do not have. And if they are your brothers and sisters, then share with those who are in need. The goal, he said, is righteousness and equality. Righteousness is right relatedness to God and to each other. And you'll notice, I hope, that he's appealing to a Gentile church, a Greek church, and saying, please share with this Jewish church. And I think part of the reason is he wants there to be unity among Jews and Gentiles. He's trying to build and bridge this divide. Share with the Jewish believers. May there be righteousness and equality and justice. In fact, at the end of Romans, he, he referenced this collection. He said, now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. Again, for those of you who do not have much money, and you're like, yeah, this is a great message and all, but I have nothing to give, take heart from this. What does he say here? He says, they owe it to them. The Jews have given them spiritual blessing upon blessing. They owe it to them to give material blessing. His point is, there are many ways to bless other people. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be possessions. If you're able to give to someone, and they're like, I have nothing with which to repay you, but I will pray for you faithfully. Well, praise God, pray for me. That is better than money. If someone can listen to me, you know, or listen to you as you pour out your heart, praise God. Not everyone has the time to listen. If someone can make a meal, Praise God, not everyone is able to make a meal for someone in need or go and change a tire or change someone's oil or all the countless ways that we can bless each other. This is not just about money here. This is about a heart inclined towards generosity, towards sharing, towards giving to those who are in need. Last thing is this. What does Paul say in order to persuade giving? He ends by saying this. It's gonna give God greater glory. Can you imagine the witness of a church community of Christians who are known for their generosity, who are known for giving extravagantly. When people know if they have a need, they will find a church who would help them, not always financially. We don't always just give out money, of course, but we are willing to help you however we can best help you. Help you find community, help you find friends, help you find a job, help you find a car, help you find prayer, whatever it might be, to know that the church is a generous community. What a witness that would be. It says 2 Corinthians 9, 11 through 13, you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Please, I, I hope that you're catching this vision of what God wants to do. This is not about money. This is not about money. This is about your heart. This is about a community of people whose hearts have been so transformed by the gospel of God's grace, who trust that they have a heavenly father who will provide everything that they need, that they are eager to give, that they are inclined towards generosity, that they are looking for ways to serve and bless others as they have been blessed by God. First John 3, 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to also lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us love with words, not love with words or tongue, but with actions and with truth. John's always a little harsher in the way he puts it, but he's, he's basically saying the same thing. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. 
How can the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ be in you if you do not have compassion on those who do not have? And you know individually you cannot meet every need. We know that, right? There are so many needs out there and we cannot meet every need. We cannot take in every orphan. We cannot, you know, cure every disease, relieve every famine. But if our hearts are inclined towards generosity, if we've been transformed by the grace of God, then we will look for ways to serve and give. And when they come our way, then we can prayerfully discern whether that's a, something for us to meet or for our church to meet. A generous and giving heart is evidence that you've been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you know who God is, that you know that he loves and cares for you. So I encourage you this morning to, to, not, to not hoard, to not clutch tightly, but to be generous as he's been generous with you. If you know, if you look at your heart this morning and this has been like a mirror to you and you're like, yeah, that's not me. I am not generous. I do not like giving. I do not want to give. Then again, come to the Lord this morning. This is why as a church, we preach the gospel every week, right? It's not law. It's not give and do this. It is the gospel that transforms. The more you understand the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, the more you understand the gift of Jesus given on the cross for your sins, the, 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 that you have been adopted, that you're an heir, that everything that is his is yours for eternity, the more you get that, the more it just transforms every area of your life, including your generous generosity, including how you handle your money. Let's close in prayer. God, we confess to you that we are not a generous people so often. We are stingy. We are tight-fisted. And so often it is because we don't trust you, we don't trust that you'll provide for us, or we don't have compassion on others the way you had compassion on us. And so we ask for your forgiveness, Lord. And we pray that we might catch a greater vision of Jesus given on the cross for our sins, of the grace and generosity of our Father, that that might transform our hearts and free us from fear, that we might give generously, that we might care for those who are in need. May our church be known as a generous and giving community. May we individually be known as generous and giving people that you might receive more glory and praise through our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.